Hello friends, my name is JJ. So in 2015, they installed a big sign out front of Toronto City Hall with the city's name in enormous light up letters. It quickly became one of Toronto's most iconic city landmarks, but as is so often the case in Canada these days, some people soon wanted them to work in some acknowledgement of the country's indigenous peoples. Accordingly, in 2018, the city government added this to the Toronto sign. It is a symbol that has come to be known as a Native American American medicine wheel, with this specific design being the product of a big 1991 summit in Colorado in which 40 different North American elders synergized various different medicine wheel type traditions from their respective nations to create a single continent-wide icon. Here is a basic description of what it represents according to Don Coyes, a Mohican man from Wisconsin who is considered one of the leading figures in the modern symbols creation. The circle is sometimes explained using the four directions. If you were to look at that circle, you would see an east, a south, a west, and a north, signifying the four directions. The medicine wheel teaches about a cycle of life. In the east, you have the direction of the baby. In the south lies the direction of the youth. In the west would be the direction of the adult. And the north is the direction of the elder. There is also a cycle of seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. There are four directions of human growth, the emotional direction, the mental direction, the physical direction, and the spiritual direction. And he goes on to describe the various other things the wheel embodies, including the four base elements of land, air, water, and fire, the four continents, and the four main races of man. In organizing things this way, the medicine wheel purports to offer a holistic theory of how all of life's big concepts are best understood as existing in four-way relationships to one another through harmonies, contrasts, and complements. In short, the Native Americans embrace a form of what I am going to call quadrant theory, or the idea that the best way to interpret knowledge is through a four-category axis, usually represented as a square or circle cut into four equally sized pieces. Quadrant theory has proven to be one of mankind's most popular methods for understanding the world around us, not only transcending time and geography, but able to be used in all sorts of wildly different contexts for all sorts of different purposes. But why? Why are we so obsessed with organizing knowledge this way? Let's see if we can find out. Now, I am no anthropologist, but I think it is relatively obvious that humans are inherently predisposed to interpret the world through binaries. After all, we have two parents and most of our major body parts come in twos, and many of our most important states of being seem to exist as one thing or the other. You know, man or woman, awake or asleep, alive or dead. A great deal of human mythology has accordingly always reflected a fascination with duality, especially narratives about good and evil, heaven and hell, God and the devil. But of course, we humans were never quite so simple-minded as to accept a world entirely defined in this take-it-or-leave-it way. By adding a second binary, we were able to add a critical layer of nuance, the idea that a binary itself could contain a binary. The yin-yang, which is an ancient Chinese concept that predates Christianity by several centuries, is a wonderful example of this. On the one hand, it states that the fundamental facts of life are defined by dualities, man or woman, light or dark, dark, hot or cold, yada yada. But then it also concedes that each side of the duality itself contains a duality, how both things always contain a little bit of the other. There is no such thing as complete darkness, there is always a little bit of light. It was the scientists and philosophers of ancient Greece, however, who first really ran with the idea of using a formal four-way quadrant to organize the fundamental facts of the world. This Greek system, which is usually known as the four temperaments or four humors system, was basically a kind of four-way yin-yang in which an endless assortment of things could be slotted into one of four quadrants based on their defining properties. So there were four main personality types, which were in turn said to be caused by amounts of what they believed to be the four types of fluid in the body, which had properties similar to the four elements, which they believed defined the four seasons and so on. It is obviously quite similar to the Native American thing we talked about earlier, suggesting there is something about processing the world this way that comes so naturally to humans, it basically transcends culture. Anyway, as the centuries went on, the Greek quadrant system got more and more complicated with more and more stuff getting crammed in. Well into the Middle Ages, Ages, it remained one of the Western world's leading systems for understanding everything. As you can see, even the modern zodiac system has its roots in this. People back then would make all sorts of major life decisions according to this thing. Like, oh, should my son marry this girl? I don't know, he's got a lot of quadrant three energy and she's really more of a quadrant four. And it is 
Quadrant 2 season. Now, obviously, this system gradually fell out of favor as mankind gained a more scientifically grounded understanding of the world. But as a method for understanding personalities, it survived for a surprisingly long time. It is arguably still a part of Western culture even now. So, broadly speaking, the Greeks believed that the four main personalities were upbeat, depressed, grumpy, and calm. This isn't that wild of a conclusion, and to this day, so-called four temperament ensembles remain common in fiction whenever a story revolves around four main characters. But even beyond this, the idea that man fundamentally only has four core personalities is one that has proved enticing to psychologists and social theorists well into the 20th century and beyond, particularly once the pseudoscience of personality testing started to take off as a way of measuring things like aptitude for a job or romantic compatibility with a partner. In 1928, a psychologist named William Moulton Marston wrote an influential book called Emotions of Normal People, in which he posited that most normal people had one of four personalities, dominant, influential, submissive, or compliant, which could then be charted on a so-called disc quadrant, a system which still has its fans to this day, although these days they tend to update some of the names to sound a little bit less pejorative. The Berkman personality test was born a few years later in 1950, based on the theories of Roger Berkman, who said that in his mind, people were fundamentally either doers, communicators, analyzers, or thinkers. This system too is still being used by millions around the world, at least according to the Berkman Institute. Now, the most famous personality test of the 20th century, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, which has its roots in the theories of the famed psychoanalyst Carl Jung, does not use a quadrant, or at least it didn't until a guy called David Kiersey came along in 1978 and wrote a popular book called Please Understand Me, which argues that the 16-axis Myers-Briggs system could actually be condensed into a simpler four-quadrant system that he called the Kiersey Temperament Sorter. According to his system, people were either guardians, idealists, artisans, or rationalists. All of these four personality theories, I should note, were classic examples of double binaries, in the sense they would start with a binary, like say extrovert or introvert, and then add another, like abstract thinker versus concrete thinker, in order to create four discrete categories. No one was ever completely dark or completely light. Anyway, these were but three examples of the four basic personalities fad that swept America in the latter half of the 20th century, which was in turn part of an even bigger post-war fad of using the quadrant theory to explain just about everything. The 20th century was a time when there was a tremendous market for men pitching confident theories of order and organization to help the hapless public make sense of the increasing complexity of their glorious post-industrial technocratic society. And quadrant theory, with its pseudo-scientific, pseudo-mathematical pretenses, proved a remarkably versatile way to explain much more than just whether you were a dom or a sub. The corporate world, for instance, went nuts for quadrant theories. They still are, really, as anyone with an MBA can probably attest. In 1964, the business gurus Robert Blake and Jane Mooton wrote a book called The Managerial Grid, which put forward the idea that all business executives could be charted on a double binary that measured concern for the employees on one side and concern for the bottom line on the other. Then, in 1968, Bruce Henderson, the head of Boston Consulting, created this, the growth share matrix, which suggested that there were really only four kinds of products a company could sell, as determined by whether they held high or low market share, and whether the market size was increasing. And, as was increasingly common with these sorts of things, Henderson also gave each of his four segments cute little nicknames, stars, pets, cash cows, and question marks. The time management matrix, meanwhile, was popularized in the iconic 1989 bestseller, The Seven Habits of Highly effective people by famed Mormon business consultant Stephen R. Covey. Based on a system supposedly used by President Eisenhower, it argues that all of life's tasks fit into one of these four categories of importance, and that one of the ways you become a highly effective person is by being able to identify if something is a do, decide, delegate, or delete. Really, the amount of unified theories that people dreamed up using this double binary quadrant system were basically endless. There were quadrant theories to explain economics, relationships, 
relationships, religion, even the success of Hollywood movies. But let's talk about the one that you're all the most interested in, the political compass. Born in 1943, David F. Nolan was an American guy who was very influenced by the libertarian philosophy of Ayn Rand. He thought that the United States needed a new political party, but was frustrated that Americans were so stuck in a two-party binary mindset that could only conceptualize politics as a matter of liberals versus conservatives. So in 1970, he came up with a quadrant theory of his own. Here is how the New York Times explained it in his 2010 obituary. The graph has two axes, one labeled economic freedom and the other called personal freedom. Under Mr. Nolan's scheme, libertarians dwell in the corner of the graph where both kinds of freedom are greatest. His hope was to persuade people to think of politics as a debate between libertarian and authoritarian positions rather than as one between the traditional left and right. Politicians from the new party that Nolan would help found, the Libertarian Party, would accordingly become real evangelists of the Nolan chart theory of politics. They would encourage voters to take a personality style quiz about their political views that more often than not conveniently revealed them to be libertarians. In the year 2000, a journalist from New Zealand named Wayne Brittenden created an online knockoff version of the Nolan test, rebranded as the political compass. Brittenden had similar political biases to Nolan in terms of being fixated on the idea that political philosophies were best measured through the presence or absence of authoritarianism. Sometime over the last couple of years, Brittenden's version of the chart has really taken off with the extremely online Zoomer set, who seem fond of using it as their primary metric for understanding politics. My young YouTuber pal Gregory Guevara, better known as JREG the Junior Egg, has played a particularly big role in popularizing it, as well as pushing this idea that the four fundamental political personalities are fascist, capitalist, communist, and anarchist. Some online people have gotten even more extreme, attempting to literally map every political thought and thinker that has ever existed onto the Britain Den chart. This whole renaissance of interest in what is basically just a 50-year-old political quiz provides a pretty good illustration of just how compelling these quadrant theories have proven to be even in the modern world. Most of the big ones we've looked at today are still being used to make money for the various institutions set up by whoever originally created them. And based on some of the numbers on their websites, it is not unreasonable to say that probably a majority of Americans have been taught to use one of these things at some point in their lives through quizzes, seminars, self-help books, and the like, which only makes sense. I mean, as I said, quadrant theories have a really old pedigree and have historically been employed whenever the complexities of the modern world feel overwhelming by appealing to our deep-seated human disposition towards tidy binaries. And for all the advancements we've made in science and technology, our world is still as hard to understand as ever, and so for that matter, are we. So even though all of the quads that we've looked at today are based on a methodology that is obviously very flawed in its simplistic reductive nature and accordingly has no shortage of critics, it's not really surprising that they're still around and that people are still profiting from inventing new ones or reviving interest in the old. So I would be curious to know if any of you guys have a personal experience dealing with a quadrant theory of one form or another, given, like I said, that it is very statistically likely that you have, or if you have an idea for a new quadrant theory that you think the world really needs, I'd love to hear about that too. Anyway, let me know in the comments and I will see you all next week.